In this demo, I'll be talking in detail about the point scene and workflow. So the whole workflow starts with necessary imports. After that, uh, we have to arrange our last files into a particular folder structure. So a folder by the name of train should have your training data set and a folder by the name of val should have your validation data set. It is recommended to have diversity in your data set. So basically diversity in your training data set as well as your validation data set. So we get a real picture of how well the model is training. So example of that would be that if you want to train a model uh, for building points, then it is recommended to have different sort of architectures in your training data set and di different sorts of geographies. So by changing geographies, you will have different ranges of uh, z values so basically the terrain will change some places will have mountainous terrain some will have a uh, plain so that sort of uh, variation actually helps the model in better uh, generalization at it and it makes it robust you can also keep some uh, files separate which can act as a, a test data set and uh, try your model there after the training then now the next uh, step in the workflow is export point data set at this step, the last files are converted into an intermediate format which is needed for the next step of preparing the data. Now here we have multiple parameters, some are optional, some are mandatory. The optional ones have some smart defaults already set. Now for extra features, extra features is used for uh, mentioning extra attributes like intensity, uh, R, G, P or uh, number of returns where apart from mentioning the attribute name we also mention what is the range of that attribute so in our case intensity was ranging from 0 to 5000 so we have mentioned it here now another parameter is block size the default value of block size is 50 units now let me start with defining a block a block is a three dimensional space and within a block all those points will be passed into the neural network at once so basically group of blocks make a batch and a block is a group of points now block size depends on the coordinate system and your object of interest let's just say that your object of interest is building and a particular area can have varying uh, area a varying carpet area for a building so warehouses can be larger in size so they will have a bigger area so a 50 by 50 three dimensional space won't actually cover the whole object within it so in those cases you can actually increase your block size or if your object of interest is smaller then also you can adjust uh, the block size in those cases too but uh, we have found that a block size of 50 works in best in most of the cases now Block size also depends on your coordinate system. So if your coordinate system follows uh, feet or degree, then accordingly you should change your block size. There is something which is indirectly related to block size, which I want to highlight here. Uh, it's that during the training and during inferencing, at both the stages, the data sets coordinate systems unit should be same. So it can be meters at both the stages, feet or degrees but there shouldn't be any interchange of uh, these units, the coordinate systems unit. So this is so because 50 meters, 50 feet and 50 degrees will cover different real world areas and will cover different sizes and different uh, uh, like quantities of object of interest. Before moving to the next parameter, max points, I want to quickly highlight two more aspects about block size. So the default value of 50 unit is based on the assumption that the user will provide a data set uh, where the coordinate systems unit is in meters. Now another thing is that uh, when we define the block size, we are actually defining the X and Y range of those blocks. So basically the Z value will be automatically calculated and adjusted depending upon the ranges of z points within that those block 
so we are only defining the area or you can say that the x and y unit of that particular cuboid moving on to the next step of preparing uh, the data using the exported data at the previous step so here we pass uh, the location of that particular folder where we exported our data we provide the data set type and we provide the batch size if you have a larger vram you can increase the batch size data.classes can tell you about what the classes uh, your data set or your training data set has so in this case uh, our data set has 1 2 4 22 and 7 class codes so now let's talk about visualization of uh, prepared data within the notebook itself so we can do this uh, using show batch and where the rows will decide how many scenes you want to display and color mapping can be used to assign apart from the default colors uh, whatever you want to so in this case for example 22 class is shown here on in this scene and the color is defined as per the class mapping we have defined at this step here now mask class is used to hide other classes uh, like and so this will be very useful in comparing uh, the ground truth and the prediction and understand the interclass noises i'll talk about mask class uh, later in the demo uh, another uh, parameter is max display point so basically uh, browser uh, has a limitation related to rendering so we have set a default value of 20,000 but you can change this value if you want uh, a detailed uh, visualization of the scene next step is training the model so we create the points in a model object pass the data which we created in the previous step now this is followed by finding an appropriate learning rate using a find. After that we use fit to train our model. Now where we mention the number of epoch. So this is just a demo so that's why I have used 5 epochs. And then uh, we mention the learning rate and then there are other optional parameters uh, for functionalities of early stopping tensor board or iters per epoch. Now I'll uh, talk about some best practices at this stage. Now early stopping equals to true gives us the freedom that uh, at any uh, particular stage of training if the model stops improving so the training will stop automatically without any intervention. So let's just say that if you have mentioned 50 epochs then around 20 or 15 uh, 15 or 16th epoch if the model is not improving for uh, consecutively uh, multiple epochs then uh, the training will stop the next parameter i'm going to talk about is iteration per epoch so in cases where we have a very large training data set and then each epoch takes a lot of time then in those cases for faster completion of epoch you can use iteration per epoch uh, to reduce the time taken for a single epoch now another uh, parameter is tensor board so tensor board will help in visualizing the progress during the training and even after it using uh, this command now you can see the results of the tensor board in this tab here These graphs related to metrics and model stats gives us a better understanding how the model is training during the training itself live or even after the training is finished. Now moving on to the next step of visualization of results. Now it is uh, the parameters here are very similar to the show batch. Uh, the one which I will focus mostly here is mass class because using mass class we can understand the interclass noises within a class so basically let's just say that on the left uh, uh, we can see this particular tall building in the center and because we have only trained it for five epochs and that too on a very small data set so the model is still trying to learn and we can see that it has learned but it's still we can see some other classes too so these are those interclass noises the next step is saving the model so apart from saving it we can also check the per class metric so in this case for the class codes 1 2 4 7 22 we have the precision score recall score and the f1 score so after that the next step is uh, predict class which is the inferencing step 
and here we have three uh, different features available with us which is selective classification remap and preserve classes I'll explain these uh, with an example for better clarity let's switch to pro to better understand these three functionalities I'll start with remap classes so for interoperability we can use remap classes or uh, let's just say that if your model was trained on uh, 0 and 1 and where 0 means building and 1 means everything else then you can remap it to any other class uh, so let's just say in this scene this particular building we can see that all the buildings are mapped or represented by class code 16 and but our model was trained on 0 and 1 so if we use our model and try to predict here then uh, it will replace all these points or it will actually uh, classify a unclassified scene into buildings and everything else where we'll only have two class codes 0 and 1 but if you want to maintain this uh, nomenclature of uh, naming buildings with the 16 class code or we can also follow the ASPRS code then in those cases we can remap it similarly remap can be used to combine uh, multiple classes into one super classes so not only you can do one to one remap but you can also do many to one remap so here we can see in this line here uh, in this example we can see that okay the models class 3 uh, is remapped to 4 and class 5 is remapped to class 4 so this means that we are combining 3 and 5 classes with 4 so this is how we can combine multiple classes to super classes so you can correlate this with the vegetation so we have low vegetation high vegetation medium vegetation so we can, and the model is trained on all these three so you can actually combine uh, your uh, these three classes in your output so this is how you can utilize remap classes the next functionality i want to talk about is selective classification it gives us flexibility and control over trained models protection so if our model is trained on five to six classes and we want only subset of those in the protection then uh, we can use selective classify to mention those classes and the protection will only happen for those corresponding classes another uh, utility of uh, selective classification is combining knowledge of multiple models on a same data set let me give you an example on how to uh, combine different uh, uh, models knowledge on a same data set so here in pro we can see this scene so here I've used three different models uh, one was capable of differentiating between uh, ground and everything else another was capable of differentiating between buildings and everything else and the third one was capable of differentiating from trees with everything else and I use these three models in an iterative way on a same data set and while doing this uh, one uh, particular iterations output was another iterations input so I use all the three models uh, one after another and I use selective classify to only mention uh, these three uh, class codes belonging to these three object of interest ground and uh, buildings and trees and I skipped the everything else class code so in that way what happens is that uh, uh, we get the best what the model could offer let's talk about the third functionality of preserve classes Preserve classes can be used to uh, preserve the classes in the input file and those points which belong to those classes will not be touched during production. So this can be used to control the noise and it can also be used to preserve uh, uh, or update uh, the classes uh, in old data set. So let's just say that this is an old data set where we have these particular classes which are very accurate but we also want to further uh, differentiate between cars and low vegetation so in this case we will preserve all the rest of the classes buildings trees and uh, ground and we can run a model which can differentiate between these two so the model won't give any noise or or modify the already good classification results of other classes so in these cases we can use uh, preserve classes uh, to update either old data set and at the same time preserving uh, the classes which were classified uh, with a higher accuracy.